For the last two decades, the Western world has watched China's technological rise with a mixture of disbelief, dismissal, and more recently, alarm. The story that is most often told is a simple one. It's a story of imitation. The narrative goes that China is a copycat nation. You've heard it, and you've certainly seen it. In the early 2000s, this was undeniable. The first generation of Chinese internet companies were, frankly, pixel-for-pixel imitators of their Western counterparts. Sohu, which became Sohu, was a clone of Yahoo. Xiaonei was a clone of Facebook. And the founder of Xiaomi, uh, a company touted as the Apple of China, famously took the stage in a black turtleneck and jeans evoking Steve Jobs. This narrative is convenient. It's also wrong. It's wrong because it mistakes the first chapter for the entire book. It confuses a pragmatic strategy for a permanent identity. Yes, China copied, but this isn't a uniquely Chinese trait. Every economic success story, from the United States copying British textile mill designs to Japan in the 1970s copying American electronics, involves a phase of imitation. It is the logical first step in catching up. As the sociologist S. Colum Gilfalan said, an invention is simply a new combination of prior art. The copycat story is comfortable because it implies a lack of originality. It suggests that China can only replicate, never innovate. But this is where the story and Western analysis begins to fail. The second part of the myth is that when copying wasn't enough, China's tech giants only succeeded because of protectionism. The argument is that the Great Firewall blocked Google, Facebook, and Twitter, leaving a protected garden for domestic players like Baidu, Tencent, and Weibo to flourish without competition. This, again, has a kernel of truth. Protectionism was a factor for some companies. Had Google been allowed to operate freely, Baidu would have had little chance of capturing 70% of the search market. But this narrative is a crutch. It cannot explain the most important battles of China's tech war. It cannot explain what happened when the foreign giants were allowed in. Let's look at the evidence. eBay entered China full of confidence. It was defeated decisively by Alibaba. Why? Because Alibaba understood the local market. It made listing free, slashing fees for suppliers, and it understood that Chinese consumers and merchants needed a different trust mechanism. Amazon operated in China for years. It was not blocked. It lost out to JD.com. Why? JD understood that Chinese consumers love discounts but distrust memberships like Amazon Prime. It built a logistics network of staggering scale and speed that Amazon couldn't match. Uber waged a multi-billion dollar war for the Chinese ride-sharing market. It was defeated and acquired by the local champion, Didi. Why? Because Didi simply outcompeted, outmaneuvered, and outlocalized Uber, understanding its drivers and customers far better. These companies weren't protected. They fought. They won. They were better at adapting, innovating, and executing in the world's most ferocious competitive landscape. The story of copycats is where China began. But it's not how they became kings. To understand that, you have to understand China's unique type of innovation. The West is brilliant at zero to one innovation. This is the revolutionary breakthrough, the invention of something entirely new. The personal computer, the internet, the core algorithms of AI, China, so far, has not been a zero-to-one nation. Instead, it has mastered what I call one-to-n innovation. One-to-n is not just tinkering. It is the creative and relentless adaptation, application, and scaling of existing technologies into new business models, new processes, and new markets. And in this, China is now the world leader 
This one-to-n innovation takes three forms. First, making existing technology better and cheaper. We see this in hardware. Huawei's top-end handsets are half the cost of an iPhone, with cameras that are arguably superior. Xiaomi's sleek smartphones cost even less, and in 2021, it was ranked as the number one global smartphone brand. This isn't just copying, it's relentless, cost-driven process innovation. Second, new applications of existing technology. China may not have invented machine learning, but its applications of AI are world-class. You see it in self-driving cars, autonomous drones, and the world's most advanced facial recognition systems. You see it in the um, Ehang 184, the world's first aerial passenger drone, capable of flying a person for 23 minutes. Third, and most important, is business model innovation. This is China's true sweet spot. Chinese entrepreneurs are masters at finding new ways to monetize services and attract customers. Pinduoduo, the fastest growing company in history, didn't just sell goods, it reinvented re commerce as a social event. It's Costco meets Disney. You form teams with friends and family to get group discounts, you play games to win prizes. Meituan didn't just deliver food, it combined Groupon, Grubhub, TripAdvisor, and Yelp into a single, massive, super app. The video platform ITE doesn't just stream shows. It allows viewers to pause the program, identify the clothes an actor is wearing, and buy them on the spot. This is not imitation. This is a new, um, demand-driven and intensely creative form of innovation. And it is fueled by the single most brutal competitive environment on Earth. The jungle that I mentioned, it's, it's real. The rivalry between Chinese tech companies is reminiscent of the Warring States period. It's a ruthless 24-7 battle. This is the home of the 996 work ethic, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week. A more updated version is 007 on call 24-7 with no personal life. This ferocious competition pushes companies to relentlessly upgrade, cut costs, and find any possible edge. This domestic jungle is what forges the kings. By the time a Chinese company succeeds at home, it is so battle-hardened that competing globally, even against Silicon Valley, seems easy by comparison. So why did China and not India or Brazil or Russia become the world's other tech superpower? It's not just the work ethic. The Chinese playbook was supercharged by two unfair advantages that no other country could match, scale and backwardness. First, scale and its child, big data. In the 21st century, the old saying, data is the new oil, is profoundly true. In an age of artificial intelligence, the best algorithm doesn't win. The best algorithm with the most data wins. This is where China's 1.4 billion people become its ultimate strategic asset. Alibaba has over 800 million users. Tencent has over a billion users on WeChat. Tencent's payment systems, combined with Alibaba's Alipay, generate a trove of useful data. The scale is hard to comprehend. In China, digital payments in a single day can exceed the total amount of digital payments in the United States in an entire year. Every coffee, every bus ticket, every QR code scanned by a panhandler creates a data point. This massive real-time data stream is the fuel for China's AI. It allows companies like Tutiao to perfect their newsfeed algorithms and and financial to build credit scoring models for people who have never had a bank account. The second advantage is, paradoxically, um, backwardness. This is what we call technological leapfrogging. It turns out being behind is a huge advantage. Why? Because you are not burdened by legacy systems. It is almost always easier to build from a clean slate 
than it is to demolish an existing structure to make way for the new. Let's look at payments. The United States was the pioneer of the credit card. It built a massive, expensive, and now old system. For the last decade, the U.S. has been slowly, painfully upgrading its bank cards from magnetic strips to chips. China, in the 1990s, had no consumer credit system. It was a cash-based society. So when the internet and smartphones arrived, China skipped credit cards entirely. It leapfrogged directly to QR codes and digital payments, a system that is now far more advanced, convenient, and integrated than anything in the West. This logic applies everywhere. Retail. Um, The U.S. had a vast, efficient network of suburban big box stores. China did not. So China leapfrogged directly to e-commerce, which is now 10 times more prevalent than in the U.S., Infrastructure. New York's JFK Airport was state-of-the-art in 1948. It is now old and crumbling, but it's too embedded to replace. Beijing's new Duxing Airport was built from scratch with facial recognition, smart heating, and robotic systems. China's copycat phase allowed it to stand on the shoulders of giants. Its backwardness allowed it to leapfrog right over them. So China has used one-to-end innovation, big data, and leapfrogging to become a true tech king. The story is a stunning success. But this brings us to the final chapter, the future. China is a king of one-to-end, but it is not yet a king of zero-to-one. Zero-to-one is the fundamental breakthrough. It's the new materials, the next-generation communications, the core software. And in these areas, China is still critically dependent on the West and its allies. This is China's great vulnerability. The most glaring example is semiconductors. These are the throat-choking technologies, the core of everything from a smartphone to a satellite. China is proficient at designing chips, but it cannot manufacture the highest grade, most advanced chips. Its top foundry, SMIC, is at least two generations behind the global leaders, Taiwan's TSMC and South Korea's Samsung. Why? Because China cannot build the machines that make the chips. Specifically, it cannot build the extreme ultraviolet EUV scanner, arguably the most complicated machine on the planet. That machine is made by one company in the world, ASML, in the Netherlands. And under U.S. pressure, those machines are not being sold to China. This is the hard limit of China's current playbook. So why has China, with all its resources, failed to master this? Because zero-to-one innovation requires a completely different mindset. China, as a nation, is impatient. Its entire modern identity is built on sprinting a marathon, on catching up. The national psyche is defined by duan, ping, kuai, short, flat, fast. It's a mindset that looks for rapid returns. This is fatal for basic research. Zero to one breakthroughs cannot be rushed. They don't respond to five-year plans. They require what China has always lacked, patient capital, patient people, and a patient nation. It requires an education system that values creativity over rote memorization. It requires universities to pursue knowledge for its own sake, not just to meet the government's quota for the number of patents, regardless of their quality. The copycat has become a king by mastering one type of innovation, but the final crown, true, sustainable, zero-to-one leadership is still out of reach. The Chinese state knows this, and it is responding with the only tool it has, the Zhuguo system or the integrated whole nation scheme. This is the Manhattan Project approach. Awakened by U.S. sanctions, China is now pouring trillions of yuan into a national, state-led mobilization to achieve breakthroughs in AI, quantum computing, and above all, semiconductors. 
This is the final race, the Mayor Economy and the One to End Playbook Built China 1.0. The state is now betting its entire future on the Zhuguo system to build China 2.0. The question is, can a state, no matter how powerful, plan a zero to one breakthrough? Can an impatient nation learn the patience to create? The race for the 21st century will be decided by the answer to that question.